We will now uh, continue to our next speaker, uh, Bridget Wala Umar, and uh, she is a researcher and senior lecturer at the University of Zambia. And she teaches uh, courses and conducts research related to sustainable land management, climate change, gender and natural resource governance. Welcome to share with us your food for thought, uh, Bridget. Thank you very much. And yes, as introduced, my name is uh, Bridget Walia Uma, and I'm speaking to you from Pretoria, South Africa right now, where I'm attending a course on uh, uh, food systems uh, uh, modeling in Africa. I'm very happy to be here. So you have to excuse me, my internet is not very stable, so I will switch off my camera for now, but I hope you can hear me clearly. Uh, we can move to the next slide. Yeah, so thinking about food systems in Africa, definitely Africa is a big continent, uh, 54 countries. Uh, we can't talk of one food system. And there are various ways in which uh, food systems can be categorized in Africa. So here I give three examples. So for instance, the third one, if we look at it in terms of agroecology, so you can think about areas that have low rainfall and areas that have high rainfall. So when you're discussing issues, whether for research or what is important to the uh, food system actors there, probably you would highlight um, uh, climate change issues, uh, lower rainfall, flooding, and things like that, uh, which is not what you would focus on if maybe uh, you looked at the systems, at the food systems through the lens of uh, the AU's economic blocks. So you have North, uh, South, East, West, uh, and Central. So then maybe there you tend to think of food systems in terms of uh, what kind of trade is going on um, between these different regions, who is involved, what are some of the issues, what are the outcomes for the different uh, food system actors. Or you can think of uh, food systems in terms of um, um, the agriculture systems. So is it a maize-based system? Are they growing perennial crops? Or is it more uh, pastoral? And then, of course, the issues that would be highlighted there would be very different. So different ways of looking at this. But despite this, we can pick out a few commonalities. So we can move to the next slide. Thank you. So for instance, it is said that a lot of the countries in Africa have a shared history of colonization. Uh, because of that history, things that happened then still have an impact today. If I think about my own country, Zambia, we grow a lot of maize, we eat a lot of maize. This has its roots in the colonial policies of uh, promoting maize production and maize marketing for the urban markets. So we still, this, uh, we still see this going on right now. And of course, it has implications on uh, sustainability and equity issues in terms of who has access to hybrid seed, who has access to other uh, resources needed for maize production. Then we also tend to think of uh, commonalities among the African countries and the food systems in terms of the adverse terms in which they participate in the global food system. So again, here you can think about trade uh, production from smallholder farmers, uh, maybe in Pretoria, and then exporting to maybe the EU markets. Uh, different scenario when you think about a more rural country like Malawi or Zambia, and to what extent are the smallholder farmers, who are themselves very different, they're not homogeneous, to what extent are they able to access uh, developed country markets, and then on what terms. So definitely the terms are usually unequal and this leads to a very unequitable system and also a very unsustainable one. Uh, we can move to the next slide, please. Yeah, but on a positive note, then we can also think about the commonalities in terms of uh, African countries being members of the AU. And then uh, what are some of the activities that are going on there? What are the opportunities for increased trade? Uh, if we think about the African Continental Free Trade Agreement, for instance, with its aspirations to increase uh, trade among uh, the, the African countries. And uh, after the COVID pandemic, definitely uh, most of us are thinking more um, explicitly about the need to produce local 
and not have to depend on on imports because when the markets are closed then there's a big problem and the most vulnerable of course are those uh, that don't have access uh, from other means we can also think about the role of CADIB and the agenda uh, 2063. So these are some of the uh, commonalities. So in terms of thinking about research, then definitely we need to understand more about uh, what is happening in these different uh, food systems, depending on what they are categorized or how they are categorized. And there are lots of opportunities for research on Africa, not just by Africans, but by uh, different researchers from all over the world. The important point then is to recognize that there are different ways of framing, there are different ways of um, where even you start from. Are you interested in the producers? Are you interested in the value chain? Are you interested in sort of climate change issues? And there's a lot of opportunities for that. So I'll give an example of the, my own research. So I'm part of um, what is known as the FSNET Africa. This is the Food Systems Research Network for Africa. And they have a two-year uh, fellowship program for early career African researchers. And they tend to prioritize um, women researchers, African women researchers. So the model is uh, every fellow is attached to what is known as a triad. So they have a senior researcher from um, a UK university and an African university other than their own. And then uh, what is known as a UP host, that's a University of Pretoria host. So the researcher is um, uh, basically benefiting from the experience of these three. And in addition, they have to work with um, other uh, food system stakeholders. So depending on the research that they're doing, uh, then they are linked to the relevant stakeholders. So that means uh, the producers, if it's women's groups, if it is other research uh, institutes, um, whoever the stakeholders are. So the emphasis is on multidisciplinary research, context specific research, but most importantly also research that is relevant uh, for, the, for the local community. And uh, all the stakeholders have an input in formulating research questions. And the idea is not just to conduct research, but to conduct research that policymakers can use uh, to inform their decision making. So this is a two year program and we are the first cohort and we're about 20 from um, 10 different countries and working with six different um, uh, universities. Uh, we can move to the next slide. Yeah, so in terms of the different types of research that the researchers are doing, uh, we have about uh, six themes. So you see that there's a, um, there's a wide range. And my research is based on governance and equality in uh, uh, food systems. So I talk about, um, we can move to the next slide. So I talk about things like um, how important are policies in determining the kind of uh, uh, sustainable agriculture intensification practices that farmers adopt, uh, how important are land governance issues uh, in for farmers to make decisions about the kind of agriculture uh, intensification practices, and who are these farmers, what are some of the issues that affect them, and how can they be helped. So I also look at um, the value chains and also the role of uh, international development actors, because in terms of research, they also have um, they drive the agenda. Uh, every time you respond, you respond to a call for research, you see that they will say, we're interested in this and we're interested in that. So I look at how that plays into the kind of agriculture technologies that are promoted. Uh, next slide, please. And then also I'm a member of the Zambian Women in Agriculture Research and Development. And this is an organization where we try and sort of help uh, early career uh, African researchers, Zambian researchers, but also work with other actors in the value chain. So for instance, here we're working with the women, uh, trying to help them to learn how to process their tomatoes, which usually go to waste, and help them access uh, markets on more uh, equitable terms. Uh, yeah, I think that's my last slide. Uh, thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Bridget, uh, for, for sharing.
And please also, uh, during the presentations, uh, you can post questions in the chat. We will pick up uh, some questions in the Q&A session. I will also try to um, ask some questions after each presentation. Um, since I'm working with the research network also, uh, Bridget, I find it interesting to, to know uh, from, from you, from a researcher's perspectives, if it's a big question, but what challenges and opportunities you see with the focus on food system that uh, encompass so much? It's uh, so many levels and sectors, uh, disciplines involved. Um, to narrow it down, maybe if you have any sort of factors for, for fruitful uh, collaboration and multidisciplinary collaboration within food systems that also then can be uh, used, um, utilized in society. Do you have any experience on this? It's, it's so much. It's food system can be everything. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> How do you and do it? <laughs> that's what I'm struggling to do actually right now, because I mean, wherever you start from, then it links to everything else. So if you're looking at producers and if you only look at producers, then you know that um, producers have to deal with um, input suppliers. They have to deal with markets and whatever. So, but then of course, uh, you can't do everything. So it's always important to say, uh, even when I'm, I'm, I'm working uh, from the production level or the market level, uh, what are the immediate linkages and what are those um, sort of actors that can directly impact this and then maybe uh, work with those uh, more closely, but also paying attention to the idea that it's a system. So you, whatever is happening elsewhere is also going to, uh, to affect you. So in terms of collaboration, I think it's always important to collaborate with as many sort of different disciplines, as many different actors as is possible and is practical, but definitely that uh, needs to be done. So a line has to be drawn somewhere, definitely, otherwise it becomes too much, but it definitely not working in silos because then that doesn't help anything. I don't know if I've answered your question, but yes, it's a challenge, but also it presents very interesting opportunities uh, to work uh, with different kinds of collaborators, who bring different uh, perspectives to the different issues. Yeah, thank you. Hey, thank you so much, Bridget. I think we can go on separately on, on this question. It's a big one. Uh, yeah. I will post uh, one more question from Sofia Cavalieri um, from the chat. Uh, she's saying, I'm also doing an applied PhD research in Thailand, very similar approach. How do you co-create your research with communities on the ground uh, while taking into consideration also the international development aid scenario, as you mentioned as well? How do you yeah. move between these different levels, the local and the global scales? Yeah, so like what I said earlier, what we're trying to do now, um, I may have a research project in mind. I go to the communities and I know that this is what I'm interested in, but I'm very open to what are their issues. So even the approach we're using, uh, we're using what we're calling a sort of a social learning lab. And this is where you go and you sit with the different kinds of um, communities within the communities. And you, you do a lot of listening and you encourage them to do a lot of uh, uh, reflection. So maybe you have women and men in different groups, the, the, the youth and the age in different groups, and then you encourage them to sort of listen to the others and also for the researchers to listen so that you really get their perspectives. And then also you try and do the same with the sort of the higher level uh, international kind of research. So basically like uh, part of what we're doing here speaking to each other from different regions so that we can understand but also knowing that when we go back we really need to give the space to the sort of local level uh, actors uh, and to hear what they have to say about what is important to them uh, thank you uh, thank you so much. I think we have time for uh, one more question before we move on. Um, you talked about I mean, the, the plurality. There are so many different systems, so many different groups. And uh, how in food systems, how can we um, better assure participation of marginalized groups in society, uh, in, in countries, um, uh, in food systems transformation to be part um, of the transformation of food systems, if you have any input on on this big question yeah yeah i would say the same just give them the space give them the space to share and also give them the opportunity to do what they have to do sometimes we we have uh, defined research agendas from elsewhere and then when we go there we get them to do what we want but it's very important just to give them the space 
they understand the issues and then um, pick it up from there. So high level meetings are good, but we also need those meetings at the grassroots where the marginalized people are so that uh, we hear what they have to say. I, I think there's more of this happening now. We're not there yet, but I think there's a bit more of this uh, happening and I'd like to see more of that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much.